You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Gavin Andrews. He's the Managing Director at HeartMath. Uh, the website is heartmath.co.uk. So, Gavin, thanks for coming. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Richard. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, as you said, I'm, I'm, I'm the director of, of HeartMath in the UK. HeartMath is actually a US-based business, so hmm. the headquarters are over there, and I run the business for them under license in the UK and Ireland, and increasingly other bits of Europe popping up. So, yeah, that's our website in the UK, and the headquarters in the US is, is heartmath.com. Okay, great. Excellent. And then, um, yeah, I've, I've seen HeartMath at several conferences throughout the year, and I've heard about heart rate variability, but I've never looked into it. So that's why I wanted to have you on. Uh, it seems like a uh, trend that the uh, you know in the, in the sports uh, and the health world is becoming very big. So w- what is uh, heart rate variability? You know, to start off with. Yeah. Okay. Well, in simple terms, the heart rate variability is just the, the beat to beat changes in in the heart rate. So it's the heart's rhythm basically. Um, the heart's always speeding up and slowing down. Um, so even if you've got a heart rate, resting heart rate sat there, Richard, at 60 beats a minute, your heart is not beating once every second. In fact, you'd be dead if it was. So what's really happening is it's just speeding up and slowing down, and that's based upon what's going on with the autonomic nervous system, um, what your body requires of your autonomic nervous system and your heart. And so it's a really interesting measure for looking at the dynamics of the autonomic nervous system um, and yeah, what, what it's doing, how, how activated it is or how relaxed it is, what the interplay is really between the branches of the autonomic nervous system. Hmm. So uh, so people's heart rates, you know, I know if you get stressed or if you're sleeping or if you meditate or things like that, you know, the heart rate changes. But uh, what does the natural variability look like in uh, a healthy versus an unhealthy person? And why do we think variability occurs? Well, um, so what's healthy really depends upon the individual, their age and their gender. Um, So as opposed to kind of giving you numbers around that, um, what I can say is that generally more is better than less. And so the reason we have variability really is just to enable us to respond to the demands of the day, um, whether that be running for the for the bus or whether that be sitting down digesting our dinner on the on the sofa as we watch tv um, just anything and everything throughout our day requires that our autonomic nervous system responds uh, appropriately and heart rate variability really is a, is a window into that and it's evidence that we've got the, the flexibility the elasticity if you like to be able to deal with those challenges both both large and small um, and really, you know, when it comes to a stress reaction, you know, this is this is an evolutionary thing. It, it means that the body is able to respond dynamically when we need to fight or run away or play dead or whatever it might be. Um, that's when uh, you know, the heart rate variability becomes very, very important. And really, you want more of it than less because that's going to enable you to, to respond appropriately and basically survive if your life's in danger. Uh, but like I said, it's not always that extreme. It's just generally responding throughout the day. Space links as well as circadian rhythms and breathing and metabolism, emotions, uh, your immune system. So everything really is connected and is feeding in. Uh, and the variability is a really, really strong and independent marker, actually, for, for health, both physical, physiological, and also psychological or, or mental health and resilience. Well, okay, so if your heart rate couldn't vary, right, if you were under a physical strain, it couldn't accommodate, um, you know, I guess it couldn't bring enough oxygen and and, uh, and blood to the muscles to be able to, you know, to let you perform, et cetera. But uh, 
you know, going deeper, what is the function of heart rate variability in, you know, every, every I guess, typical day-to-day function? Well, yeah, that is, that is its function, really. It's just to enable you to respond appropriately. So it's being, heart rate variability is really just a, you know, reflection or a measure uh, of, of what's going on. So, yeah, based upon the, the demands around you, um, your heart needs to be responding appropriately. Your autonomic nervous system needs to be speeding up and slowing down appropriately, coming back to balance. Um, so this is also connected to homeostasis, which you, you've probably heard of, which is the body just regulating itself back to balance. Um, so as a measure, it's useful both in real time to show us the dynamics of what's going on there and then is primarily what we use it for. But it can also be useful to track over time as well to see within an individual the extent to which they're being depleted throughout the day. So how much sympathetic or kind of like accelerator activity have they got going on? Uh, and then how much parasympathetic or rest or digest activity have they got? So what we want to see, generally speaking, in the day is that there's balance between the two. Um, and then what, what we do see in, in some individuals is that their heart rate variability is, is, is low and that's a really good marker for the fact that they're, they're getting a bit run down, overwhelmed, um, maybe even burnt out. Why would their variability go down if they're getting run down? Uh, because basically the body is having to respond to repair them, so it's having to work extra hard. So if they've not been having enough sleep, for example, if they've been eating particularly well, then the body's under stress. And as the body's under stress, it's having to work harder and harder to bring itself back to balance. So generally that reduces HRV. So if we see people, if we track people and we see their HRV declining over time, it can be a very good sign that they're, that they're getting too, too stressed and they need to rest, recuperate, back off. Um, occasionally, occasionally you can see HRV leap up. It can even happen overnight, particularly with, with athletes. And what that shows is that they're basically a they've overtrained and so what's happening there is the the autonomic nervous system is kind of giving you some warnings for time saying hey i'm being too challenged your heart rate variability has gone down you you know you should be feeling a bit tired and maybe achy and not having the sort of energy that you used to have and then basically if you don't listen to those signals from your body then the body will act and so what happens is the parasympathetic comes on hard so it's like it puts the brakes on really hard to say hey i've given enough warnings slow down now time to relax in fact we're going to force you to do it so that that can be one case where the heart rate variability suddenly becomes very high but normally what we see when people are stressed is that it's it's lower than it should be or declines over hmm. what if you're uh, i don't know what if you're just sitting there you know reading a book or if you're talking to somebody what uh, does the heart rate vary and you know how much does it vary in, in typical people even when they're not doing anything special yeah it should vary so even while you're doing nothing which might sound a bit counterintuitive you might expect that the body should be really you know efficient and that therefore uh, if your heart is beating 60 times in a minute that it should be beating once every second so intuitively that's that's what you think would be optimal but that's not the case so it, it is always varying even if you sat down reading a book um, and okay so like in a well I, I'm a 47 year old guy I'm, I'm healthy I practice what I preach I exercise and eat relatively healthy food you know everything balance etc so if I was sitting down after our call it's the evening here in the UK um, reading my book, my heart rate variability might be um, ranging anywhere between kind of 50 and maybe 70 beats which I, just as I'm sat there. So the variability in, the, in that sense would be a range, a range of 20 beats. Um, now, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy for my age, but um, we want to be seeing some variability even when people are sat down at rest. Now, in real time, I could influence that by breathing deeply, um, by, by holding my breath, by having you know stressful thoughts and feelings going into my system. That's going to impact on it as well. So it's not like HRV is a, is a the amount of HRV you've got is a rigid or set thing. That's not the case at all. Um, but yeah, to your point, even when you're sat down, relaxing, doing nothing, your heart rate is always speeding up and slowing down. And basically, it's there to facilitate everything the body needs to do with regards to the repair process, you know, homeostasis. Um, and it's there actually doing that in case you need to respond dynamically. So I could be sat reading my book, very, very relaxed, heart rate's nice and low, um, but then there could be a, a loud, loud noise outside, you know, a car might backfire or someone might bang on my window or whatever, and I might, I might have a shock. Well, if I don't have the variability, if I don't have the elasticity and the flexibility, then I can't respond. And actually, you know, in a worst case scenario, if I didn't have a lot of variability, <clears throat> you know, I could even have a heart attack with a, with a shock like that. So 
you know, this is this is really what's going on. It's just the body's way of keeping itself flexible and adaptable so that it can respond um, appropriately to any 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 need that we might have. So what's a typical variability, you know, for someone that's sedentary versus an athlete, you know, their ranges oh, wow. that uh, you okay. guys Well, identify? this is this is kind of tricky territory, um, and I don't want to be giving numbers out when it's then concern people. But okay, as a as a forty seven year old guy, if my variability well, and there's, and there's look, Richard, there's like forty odd different measures of variability as well. So I use really? a very sim- simple measure, which is simply kind of max min in terms of the heart rate. So as a 47-year-old guy, if my max min was only kind of like two, three, four beats or something like that, that would indicate that I'm not very healthy. Whereas uh, someone who's doing, you know, endurance sports, um, you know, is, 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 a, is a really accomplished cyclist, distance runner, triathlete, something like that. Yeah, they could have a variability of, of 20, 25, 30 beats. So, you know, it's different for different people. There's a genetic component. It does it does vary in the moment just having a coffee or something like that or eating certain types of foods can impact upon it but generally speaking more is better than less and if you we know from from all the science and the research that if you have less than you should have for your age and gender that does not bode well for your health so you, you said there's more than one way to measure it instead of just i mean what, what are some of the ways that it's measured and what do those ways mean well it's it. so in, in the simplest sense uh, the way the heart rate variability is measured we call rr intervals or nn so basically you're, me- you're measuring the gaps between them, the heartbeats to put it in a simple term and then there's lots of different ways of, of crunching that data different algorithms and formulas that can be used so typically we have different measures like in the research sdnn or nssd um and so, you know, that depending on, on, on the application, researchers tend to use those types of numbers. And some of the apps that we see on the market, they're using those types of uh, approaches, and measurements of HRV in the background. Um, but then they're often creating their own numbers around that. Um, so you may have heard of like Elite HRV and iSleep, people like that. They, they, they tend to have their own proprietary number. Um, so you know that after a while your number range is kind of between 70 and 75 or something like that. But that number's actually being calculated using some of these other research measures. Um, and our RMSSD is a, is a popular one. That basically a measure of the parasympathetic. That's that's not what we we do. It's not what HeartMath is really interested in. Um, we're not primarily about HRV. HRV is just a way of measuring a state that we uh, help people learn how to get into an optimal state called coherence. Um, mm. So to, just to clarify, you know, heart math is not really, we're not really an HRV business. We're not really a, a technology business as such. We're, a, uh, well, actually we're a transformation business. We help people learn how to increase their self-awareness and regulate their, their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions, their behaviours. Um, and the state that we help people learn how to to create or to access can actually be measured with hrv so it's kind of almost well in fact in many ways the hrv side of things is an accident for us we we as a business developed um these different very simple self-regulation techniques um way back in the 1980s we founded the business in 1991 and as a training company we're teaching these techniques before we even realized that heart rate variability was something that could be used to to measure what it was we were creating so we're a bit different to everyone else the the heart rate variability data that you might get in your apple watch or your fitbit or that you might be deriving from a, a, a chest strap if you're using elite hrv or iFleet, those types of apps um, they're different to what we do i use them myself they're, they're, they're great measures but primarily there for checking in with yourself to see each day oh, how am i doing how's my battery have i, have I drained my battery too much uh, is it nice and topped up? So the main applications are, you know, for sport and readiness to train and all of those types of things, really useful for, for those types of applications. Uh, but that isn't primarily what we're about. In fact, it's not what we're about at all. What we're about is is, is practicing a, a very simple technique that facilitates putting your autonomic nervous system into balance uh, and that enables you with practice to develop a little self-awareness and ability to self-regulate your thoughts feelings and behaviors so if i'm uh you know i get the tools and if i'm stressed it'll teach me ways to relieve that stress much quicker than i otherwise would have before i'll do some sort of exercise or breathing or thinking or combination of those two and i should be able to let's say slow my heart or uh increase the variability or improve some kind of metric pretty quickly by doing is that what you're saying exactly yeah exactly so that's what we're using our technology so the techniques are based upon 
um, f- first of all, focusing out of the head and into the body, so particularly focusing around the heart area itself, um, uh, regulating the breathing. So we have a look at the balanced breathing technique, um, and the balanced breathing is, is basically it's kind of hacking into the autonomic nervous system. And so you're, you're putting your autonomic, you're consciously taking control of your autonomic nervous system, you're putting it into balance. So the balanced breathing is activating the sympathetic and the parasympathetic um, in balance, so they're synchronizing. Uh, and then once you've done that, that's a great way to just begin to, to stop stress in the system. Uh, and then when you've done that, you can then shift the, the feelings or the emotions. So you can, for example, recall um, you know, people or things that you feel appreciation or gratitude or care or love or whatever. So you've taken control of your autonomic nervous system, then you start to impact upon the hormonal system. Um, and all of this information that the heart is, is, is creating and sending to the rest of the body, the brain in particular, is then resulting in uh, having more activity in the prefrontal cortex. So therefore, you know, if you're stressed and you do this, you get the activity back in the prefrontal cortex. You can begin to, to, to think much more logically, rationally, objectively, um, do all the, the wonderful skills that you, as human beings, we can do like empathize and be creative and innovative. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that we, we train people to do and we advocate that they do on the one hand, kind of like a meditation. So there's a, you know, a dedicated practice that you do each day for five, 10, 15, 20 minutes or whatever. Um, and then also throughout the day as, a, as an eyes open in the moment technique. So as soon as you're stressed, but in a business meeting and, um, you know, colleagues are disagreeing with you or whatever, or having an argument with your partner, or you might be stuck in a traffic jam, getting stressed about getting somewhere, then these techniques are designed also to be used real time, eyes open. Mm. So what have, what have you tried? What kind of techniques and, um, you know, has it been surprising to you? Like what's, what's an experience you've had that you thought was really cool or, uh, you know, super helpful to you? So for me, my, my daily practice is, um, I do 21 minutes practice a day of a, of a technique we call heart locking. So the, the 21 minutes thing is just because someone told me that it takes 21 days to, to create a habit. So I, I challenged our community to do 21 minutes for 21 days. But anyway, they then told me it was 60 days, so I carried on doing it. But for me, yeah. what that's all about is I'm spending dedicated time each day where I'm really focusing you know, inside myself. It's just a reflective practice. And what I'm doing is I have my attention in my heart, I'm regulating my breathing so it's nice and smooth and sustained. There's an equal volume flowing in and flowing out. And then I'm focusing my um, my feelings around generally people for me that I appreciate or care for, people that I feel compassion for. Um, and part of that practice is, is, is radiating those feelings out to others and then on the in-breath breathing them for myself. So it's not, you know, it's not massively dissimilar from the compassion meditation or the meta meditation a Buddhist might do or whatever. Um, but I'm using the, the technology while I'm doing that to track the numbers, to see how coherent I'm getting. Um, because there's degrees of coherence and balance within the autonomic nervous system. Um, and then so I find that the, the numbers are really useful because they, they, they also let me know how I'm doing each day. They, they keep me real in terms of what it is I think I'm feeling or experiencing. Um, and I like the, the fact that I can look back at data over extended periods and then you know, work, work out how I'm doing, how I've been developing periods in my life when I'm getting better at it or times when it's, it's more challenging. Well, what have you noticed specifically as you've done it, you know, over time? But what, you know, what was it like in the beginning? What was it like after a few weeks of it? What did you notice? Okay, so I've been doing this for 10 years. Um, oh, wow. What I, can, what I can say to you is that I used to be a very stressful person. I used to get very anxious about my work, my performance at work. I used to catastrophize situations and relationships. Um, I used to regularly be ill in terms of bugs and colds and flus and things like that, which I'm pretty certain in hindsight was down to the fact that I was spending quite a lot of my time stressed. Um, so when I discovered heart math, you know, I've been into lots of different things and tried lots of approaches. But when I came across it, what I, what I loved was the simplicity. Um, and what I noticed very quickly was that I could create calm within myself, both phys- physically and mentally, very, very quickly, just within the space initially of a minute or two of the, of the breathing practice. And then what I thought was really cool was the fact that I could, in effect, choose how I wanted to feel. And, you know, until that time, I'd sort of been on, on autopilot, just feeling what I was feeling based upon what was going on around me or whatever popped into my head. And it really occurred to me that I might have some choice around it what I feel and when I feel it. So the fact that I could just, you know, take a pause on the day and intentionally focus on appreciation or, or gratitude or whatever, I found that to be extremely enjoyable. Um, and over time with practice, and, you know, this stuff's not magic. You dedicate yourself to it, you can 
put the time in, but it doesn't need a lot of time in my experience. Put the time in and it begins to have an impact. And so what I found over time was I was just getting less stressed. Um, it was almost like the, the bar was being raised on what was required to stress me. Um, so, you know, I was, I, was, I was just hooked. I was convinced it worked and that's why I carried on doing it. So I actually was practicing all this stuff a good few years before I even got involved in the business. Do you notice that you're a different person? You're a lot calmer and you don't have these, these issues you had before? Absolutely, yeah. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I notice, I mean, it's been a long time since I had any gaps in my practice now, but what I also noticed back then was if for whatever reason I stopped practicing, which I tended to do when, when, when life was good and I was feeling good, it's almost like you just think, well, I don't need to do this now because everything's fine. And then sure enough, it's like a muscle and as the muscle gets a bit weaker, the old patterns begin to creep back in again or, you know, the craziness of life starts to trigger you again and the tolerance level for stress goes down so yeah for sure i'm uh, i am i mean obviously i'm the same person in many ways um but i'm a different person in terms of my outlook on life um the situations i choose to put myself in um i give myself a lot more self-care and compassion for, for what i do and the decisions i make and the work that i do um i generally enjoy life a lot more i mean even to the extent of things like you know sport i'm a, I'm a like a very very amateur triathlete and in the past, I recognized I never even really used to enjoy it a lot of the time because I was just pushing myself so hard every time I trained to be faster or I had to, you know, compete and beat my friends or always beat my previous time or whatever. And, and actually, I wasn't really enjoying myself. Whereas now, I just do it for the sake of doing it. Um, you know, I listen to my body a lot more. I enjoy the, the experience and the process of the, the training and, and enjoy the competition days much more as well. So it's just a different way of, of being. Really. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> So what's the protocol for uh, new people that want to, uh, you know, work on heart math? Do they start with a device and then they do training with a device? So they do training first on their own? You know, how yeah. do people onboard? Yeah. So, okay. So, so the simplest way to onboard is there's quite a lot of free information online anyway in terms of the techniques. So the, the US site, heartmath.com and the and our site, heartmath.co.uk, there's some stuff on there which just can, can kind of get you up and running. Ne- next thing to do if you want to dip your toe into the water is we, we've written a number of books um, so we've got a book called Transforming Stress, which is particularly good in terms of helping people understand the physiology um, of stress and also then how it's impacting on the brain and then explaining some of the heart math techniques and how and why they work and what heart math HRV is. So, you know, that's the price of you know, $10, $15 for a book. Um, and then the next uh, next step up from that is the, is the biofeedback technology. So the biofeedback tech is $159 in the US, £159 in the UK. Uh, and that is kind of it's kind of like a Fitbit for the emotions, really. Um, it's just a little sensor, Bluetooth sensor, goes on the earlobe, clips on the clothing, goes Bluetooth to your phone, um, and it's specifically measuring heart rate variability coherence. So it's not measuring those other types of heart rate variability that some of those other devices measure, um, you know, for sport or, or whatever. We're specifically and solely interested in coherence and we're interested in measuring it real time so that when you practice the techniques, you can see the impact that you're having through the heart rhythm. You can see the, 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 the levels, the degree of coherence that you are achieving in the session. So, um, so yeah, that's the, that's the level. And, you know, within the app itself, there's all sorts of instructions, guided meditations, videos on how to use the technology and what the metrics and that so forth, that type of thing. Um, and then really the next step up from that is, uh, is is people who want to use this system with others. So I just uh, finished actually on Friday um, delivering one of our coach programs. So we train people to be coaches in the heart math system. Uh, and they, hmm. they, could be, they could be sports coaches, they could be educators, they could be medical professionals. I had a cardiologist on the last one actually. Um, yeah, hockey, hockey coach we had. Um, and uh, yeah, people who are like business coaches, consultants, trainers, so all sorts of different people who just recognise that this is a, this is actually a very very simple skill, and that the skills of self awareness and self regulation are extremely valuable, no matter what you do, no matter who you are, whatever walk of life. And so we train people to to go out there and, and share these techniques and the coaching models and protocols with with others, the people in the worlds that they're experts in or that they have. Have a passion. Okay. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. So, all right. So, the best way for people to take the first step is to, uh, I guess, go to heartmath.com or heartmath.co.uk, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and um, 
you know, get in touch with you there or just drop us an email at either of those addresses, info at heartmath.com or info at heartmath.co.uk um, with any questions or anything we can get back and let people know what their options are. All right, that's great. Well, Gavin, I don't, I don't have the heart to tell you that we're out of time. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. you know, we're out of time. But thanks, thanks so much for coming. It's been uh, super useful, and I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Richard. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.